In Jesus' name we pray. Our Father, we thank you for bringing us to the conclusion of our workers' retreat at this time. We bless your name for all the ministers you have used in direct preaching to us in our various seminars. And we thank you for our ministers who have given us songs, challenging us from the very first night throughout all the days until now. We pray, O oh Lord, as you have used them to minister unto us. We pray, O oh Lord, you reward them abundantly in Jesus' name. Amen. We thank you for those who cooked in the kitchen, those who helped in the hostels, those who cleaned all the surroundings, and those who served one way or the other. We know that they have done everything as unto the Lord. And we pray, O oh Lord, that as they have served, in the midst of the children of God, the ministers of the gospel, the workers and the vineyard. I pray that, O oh Lord, when we come over there to the very direct presence of the Almighty God, none will lose its reward in Jesus' name. And we who have listened to your word in the seminars, in the Bible studies and Bible doctrine sessions, and in the various messages that we have heard, we have taken decisions. We have surrendered ourselves to you. We have consecrated ourselves to you already. And we have told you there is no looking back. We are praying, O oh Lord, you will seal all our decisions and consecrations to the blood of Jesus Christ. We pray, O oh Lord, as we go back tomorrow morning to our various locations, we pray we will be faithful to you in all that we have to do in Jesus' name. Amen. Already you have spoken to us that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stood firm. And we pray that we will stand firm as well in Jesus' name. Amen. Help us, Lord. May we be true soldiers of Jesus Christ Amen. that will stand for righteousness, that will stand for the name of Christ, Amen. and that will preach the gospel without fearing the devil, not fearing demons, not fearing opposition in Jesus' name. Amen. Be with us, Lord. And we pray that as we still go through all the rest of the day, in all that we have to do, you'll see us through. And we pray that all that we have learned in this workers' retreat, we will not lose anything, but will be the stronger for it. And your word will flow through us to the various towns and villages and localities that we represent in Jesus' name. We bless your name, Lord. In Jesus' name, we pray. For the very short time we have before us, we want to consider consecration and steadfastness of true soldiers of Christ. From the time you came, Tuesday night, we have listened to quite a lot of challenges from the Lord. And all that we need to do now is to bring everything together and then to go before the Lord and say, Lord, we have heard the expression of your will. We have heard the statements of your doctrine. We have heard the exhortations and the challenges you have brought our way. And we're just praying, pleading with the Lord that we will be found faithful. 
In Second Timothy chapter 2 verse 3. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the captain of our salvation, has called us to be followers. And he wants us to live lives that are disciplined. Lives that are regulated by the word of God. Lives that follow the Lord Jesus Christ in the narrow path that leads unto heaven. Lives that will not compromise. Lives that will not be flabby, not careless. Lives that are built on the word of God solidly. And then he tells us, with all that you have seen, with all that you have heard, with all the challenges that have come to you, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And if anything ought to be our goal, if anything ought to be our decision, it is that as we're going back, we're going to stand for the Lord, and we will stand for the Lord. Can I then briefly bring to you three points? Number one, soldiers of Christ. Number two, soldiers' consecration to our captain. Number three, steadfastness in doctrine. Number one, soldiers of Christ. The Bible calls the Christian many names in scripture and these many names are descriptive of the qualities the attributes the characteristics the disposition the attitude the action the conduct the behavior the lifestyle of the believer and one name or title may show a particular characteristic while another will show another characteristic we are called children of God we are to be in our behavior and our life in likeness to God be ye holy for I God your father I am holy and it's in that passage it tells us that as obedient children, not fashioning yourself according to the laws, your former conversation, but then that you will resemble the Lord, your own Father. We're called children of God. We're called the citizens of the kingdom because we've come to a new kingdom and it's a kingdom of light. And because we're the citizens of that kingdom, we are to be ruled by the laws of the kingdom of God. We are called disciples of Christ. And disciples are learners. Those are the people that are following Jesus Christ every step of the way. And they do as he has done. Speak as he has spoken. Act as he will have acted following his steps. We are called sons, not only children, whom may call him Abba, Father. But we are called sons, because it is a part of the Son, to receive inheritance from the Lord. And so we know that we are joint heirs with Christ. And now as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the very sons of of God. We are called the salt because we are to restrain the corruption that is in the world. We are called the light of the world. And as the light of the world, we are to beam forth and shine forth into the darkness around us. But now we are called also soldiers of Christ. And as soldiers of Christ, we should be bold, we should be fearless, 
we should be standing firm for the truth of the word of God. And so Paul the Apostle says, Thou therefore, whatever others do, thou therefore, Timothy, naturally you look timid. Naturally, you look fearful. Naturally, you look shy. Naturally, you look reserved in going to a new situation. Timothy, you look at a person that could easily be intimidated by what people say and by what people do. But Timothy, looking at everything the Lord has given you, you've got salvation. The scripture has made you wise unto salvation. Not only that, you have got a ministry that needs to be fulfilled. Timothy, forget your natural inclination to fear to timidity, and to being intimidated by people, thou therefore, Timothy, that you will need to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Timothy, not only that you have these peculiarities in your psychological makeup, you also have some physical infirmity because of your stomach. And because of that, your body is so delicate you cannot even drink the ordinary water coming from Asia Minor. And you have to add some uh, things to purify that water. But even then, with the physiology, with the psychology, with the physical in your life that may appear open to weakness and to infirmity and to sickness, you can't yield to that. You have to rise above your circumstances. And you have to rise above your situation. You have to rise above your human personal peculiarities. And thou therefore, Timothy, endure hardness. There is hardness in the way. Preaching the gospel is not an easy job. Taking slaves and captives of the devil away from his son and bringing those captives to become the captives of the Lord. To have a new Lord, a new Redeemer, a new Savior, and to have a new master over their lives is not going to be an easy job. It's going to be hard and dear hardness. Not only that, the people you are going to be preaching to, they may even be hard. They may be a little bit resistant. And Timothy, there is no place. There is no place for timidity. And there is no place for cringing. There is no place for fear. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Timothy, will you remember that the people that have been chosen before you, they too, they had their peculiarities. Moses was a stammerer, but listen, he was able to stand before Pharaoh. And Joshua was inexperienced, and listen, he was able to organize around Jericho. And David was just a small lad, just a youth, and yet he was able to take on Goliath. And Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were, have been referred to as the Hebrew children. And they were slaves, not having any right in the land of Babylon. And yet they were able to stand in the kingdom of Babylon. And these uh, disciples of Jesus Christ, the early ones of Peter, and James, and John, and the others, they were looked at as ignorant, unlearned men, and yet they were able to stand. When they saw their boldness, they took knowledge of them, they had been with Christ. Timothy, will you understand? If you are weak, others have been weak too. Moses was his Tamara, and David was very young, and he had nothing going for them. If they were able to stand, Timothy, thou therefore endure hardness. And as Paul told Timothy, I believe the Lord is telling us tonight, that even though we are young, like David, even though some of us might be stammerers like Moses, and some of us might be inexperienced like Joshua, and some of us might have been in a place where, which is not your native land, which is not the place where you were born, even though it might appear like you are like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, up there where you are. Will you remember that if they were able to stand, you can stand. And you will stand in Jesus' name. Thou, therefore, therefore, because of the cross, 
Therefore, because of the victory of Jesus Christ, therefore, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world, therefore, because the lion of the tribe of Judah dwells within you, Therefore, because on this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell cannot prevail against it. Therefore, because the blood of Jesus covers you, and they overcame by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Therefore, because churches have even been planted in the place where Satan's seat is, therefore, because the everlasting arm is underneath you, therefore, because with our God nothing shall be impossible, therefore, because you can command this mountain, it can be removed. Therefore, because of the possibilities of prayer and faith. Therefore, because of the eternal decree of God. Upon this place I build my church. And the gates of hell will never prevail against it. And you ask of me nations. And I will give you nations as an inheritance. Therefore, because eventually the victory will belong to Christ and his church. And there, a time will come when the announcement will be the kingdoms of this world. I become the kingdom of our God and his Christ. Therefore, stand and endure hardness. Because the scripture is true. Because Christ is behind you. Because you cannot fail since God cannot fail. Because the everlasting power of God is supporting you and backing you. Therefore, endure hardness. Can we endure? I said, can we endure? And then it says, as a good soldier, not just as a soldier, as a good soldier, a good soldier, a faithful soldier of Jesus Christ. And I believe by the grace of God, we will stand. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and in verse 25, and every man, that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. You see, this Christian life cannot be a careless life, a flabby life, a gluttonous life, a drunkard's life, a worldly life. No, it cannot be. It says anyone that strives for the mastery. He'll be different from the ordinary people, the ordinary churchgoers, even the ordinary fellow that carries the Bible. It says that everyone, anywhere, every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, is controlled in all things, is controlled in his speech, is controlled in his use of time, is controlled in his association with the world. It's under control at the time of temptation, and it's under the control of the scripture and the spirit of God. Every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. But we, an incorruptible, I therefore, so on, not as uncertainly. And then he says, I so fight, not as one that beateth the air. And then he says, but I keep under my body. And he says, I bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a cast away. You know, there are some preachers and workers. They're not careful. They're not sober. They're not vigilant. They do not watch their steps. They act as if they cannot fall. They eat anything. Drink almost anything, wear anything, go almost anywhere, talk anything, no control. They do not have the mastery. And they may tell you that they are successful preachers. But Paul the Apostle, he said, I have preached. In fact, he said, God has raised me up. 
to be an apostle to the Gentiles, a teacher of the Gentiles. And yet he said, I keep my body under. That's the true soldier of Christ. May God help you Amen. to be a true soldier of Jesus Christ. To be watchful, to be sober, to watch what you do, where you go. And always ask yourself, if I do this, will it show that I am a true soldier of Jesus Christ? Is this not carelessness? Is this not compromise? Is this not going to make me look like the ordinary church girls who do not know their left from their right? Is this not going to make me like demons who forsook Paul and has loved this present world? Because of that you are very careful. You keep your body under the soldiers of Christ. Number two, soldiers consecration to our captain. We have Christ and he is our captain. He is the captain of our salvation. And we to be consecrated, committed, surrendered, yielded unto the Lord. We need to so abandon ourselves in the will of the Master, in the word of the Master, in the way of the Master. We need to so give ourselves completely unto the Lord that we realize we do not belong to ourselves anymore. Every decision then is taken to be His decision. Every action then is supposed to be an action dictated by Him. Every move then is to be a move already planned by Him. Anything, everything that is done is supposed to have been mapped out and planned out by the captain of our salvation. And we simply follow. And a soldier's consecration is just to say, Lord, not my will, but as thou wilt. And in First Corinthians chapter 6, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, reading from verse 19. Watch, know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? You do not belong to yourself. You cannot just go anywhere you like, take any decision you want, act any way you want, Believe whatever you want. Preach whatever you want. Mix with the people wherever you want. You are not your own. You do not belong to yourself. And a soldier of Christ knows that. And is totally abandoned, as I said. Consecrated, as I said. Dedicated and yielded and surrendered unto the Lord. Telling the Lord every time and in all things. Not what I want, but what you want. Because it says, you are not your own. You never, you cannot say anymore, I'm the owner of my time. I can do what I like. No, if you're a soldier of Christ. I'm the owner of my life. I can spend it the way I want. No, you cannot. You do not belong to yourself. My family belongs to me and I can direct my family the way I want my family to go. No, it cannot be like that. And if I like, I'll be a worker. If I like, I will not be a worker. No, you can't do that. If you're a soldier of Christ, once you have that attitude, you are disqualified from the kingdom. Because your time doesn't belong to you. Your intellect doesn't belong to you. Your wisdom doesn't belong to you. Your talent doesn't belong to you. Your gift doesn't belong to you. Your money doesn't belong to you. Your family doesn't really belong to you. Everything belongs to the Lord. And your body does not belong to, the, to you. It belongs to the Lord. It says, ye are not your own. Therefore, you cannot say, I'll paint whichever part of my body I want. I can do whatever I like. You cannot do that if you're a soldier of Christ. It's even in small decisions of, uh, uh, does the church have to control me whether I wear lipstick or not? Well, the word of God has to control you. Does the word of God have to tell me whether I wear earrings or not? The word of God has to control you. Does the word of God has to tell me whether I drink that thing or not? The word of God has to control you. Isn't it my personal private business whether I smoke whatever I want or not? No, it's not your private business. There's no private business anymore. You do not belong to yourself. 
Your body belongs unto the Lord. All these things they're saying about palming the head and not palming the head. Why don't they leave that with me? We cannot leave that with you because you don't belong to yourself anymore. Can't I have whatever air style, whatever air do I want? Is that anybody's business? Is that not the business between me and my husband? No, it's not the business privately there. It is the business of God. Because the temple belongs to Him. Not only your heart, not only your soul, not only your mouth, not only your ears, not only your hands, not only your leg, even the very ears to carry on your head. Everything belongs to the Lord. And a Christian, a soldier of Christ, a disciple of Christ, a child of God, a son in the kingdom, a citizen of the kingdom, he cannot do whatever he likes anymore because the Bible says, What? Have you been a Christian? You Corinthians, all these years, as Paul the Apostle come as a great evangelist to labor in your city in Corinth. What? You don't know this yet? What? Corinthians, you profess to have all these gifts of the Spirit. What? Don't you know this? This is the ABC, the rudiments, the beginning of the knowledge of a person that says he knows the Lord. What? Corinthians, you pride yourself. In being able to judge and being able to uh, say, I prefer Paul, I prefer Apollos. What? With all the uh, criticism that you make thinking that you know the truth and you know this and that. What? Know you not? That your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Have you been a Christian for a year and you don't know that? You've been a Christian for two years, you don't know that. You've been a Christian for five years, you don't know that your body does not belong to you anymore. He says, it belongs to the Holy Ghost. It is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Amen. Amen. For ye are bought with a price. Ye are bought with a price. Listen to me, you went to the market. And you bought Gary. And you paid with it. After you paid for that Gary, the person that sold the Gary to you took a cup, put water inside, and dipped his sand under that Gary, and puts in the water, begins to drink. You say, what is this? I paid you the money. I bought it from you. And you are still drinking out of it. He says, hey, it was out of my calabash that you brought it out. He said, this one is a thief. After you were bought with a price, the greatest price that heaven could pay, the greatest price, the blood of Jesus. After you were bought with a price, and everything is the purchase of the Lord, and everything that belongs to the Lord. Then you dipped your hand into the hand of the Lord again. And you took the time away from the Lord. And the Lord says, what is this? Look at the price I paid. No other price has ever been paid. Greater than the price I paid for you. Not only for your soul, for your soul and for your body. And you cannot take that body into the dancing hall again. You cannot take that body into the festivals of the idol worship again. You cannot do anything again with that body except what the purchaser, what the redeemer, what the Lord wants you to do with it. It says, for ye are bought with a price. Then it says, this is the only thing to do for the rest of your life. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which belong to God, which are God's. You know, there are people that all they talk about, oh, they say, I've given my soul to Jesus Christ. I've given my life to Jesus Christ. You hear them? Maybe you say that too. I've given my spirit to the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm still to hear them say, I've given my body to the Lord Jesus Christ. You can't paint it with charcoal anymore. You can't do anything with that body again anymore. You can't commit masturbation again and say, I want pleasure for myself. You can't do that again. You can't commit abortion again with that body. It belongs to the Lord now. 
It's not only your spirit. It's not only your soul. Your body now, everything belongs to the Lord. And it says, therefore glorify God in your what? In your what? In your body. And you tell me a person like Jezebel, that when she comes like this, the Lord Almighty turns his eyes the other way. He says, angels, take her away from my sight. I cannot see that. Why? When you come to appear before me, who has required this at your hand? Why? The first pews are filled with Jezebel. Why? The middle pews are filled with Jezebel. And the Almighty God in heaven, as He looks at many congregations today, and it's like this call while they are dancing and, you know, with their jerry curls, with everything and all the painting and all the dangling of the jewelry. And then they are singing and they are mentioning the name of Jesus. And they are singing and holding one another right in the presence of Almighty God. They are having immoral thoughts towards those ladies. And God Almighty looks at them. And he says, Gabriel, with his eyes closed, he said, who are those people there? Michael, who are those people there? And Gabriel says, let me listen to them, Almighty, the Most High God. And then Gabriel listens to them. And he says, they appear to be singing the songs of Zion. They appear to be calling the name of Jesus. They sing about heaven too. And he appeared to be quoting the promises of God. He says, angel, withdraw all the angels that are supposed to be in worship. Withdraw them from there. Let not those Babylonians sing the song of Zion. And if in your own fellowship, where you are, it is like that. All the all the palming, all the painting, all the lipstick, and all the fa all the fingerprints, and all the jewelry, and all the dancing, and all the disco, and all the worldly music. You are there like that. God says, "Angel, drive them away from there." You don't want to be in a place like that. You want to come before the Lord tonight. You want to consecrate your body unto the Lord. You say, oh Lord, I thought my soul was only for you. I thought my spirit was only for you. Now I realize tonight like never before that my body also belongs to the Lord. And these mouths will not tell lies anymore. And these legs will not walk to that dancing hall anymore. And even if they call it a church, even if they call it a worshipping place, if they're having all the disco thing inside there, oh Lord Almighty, if I don't have a church to go, I will stay in my room alone and I, wa I will worship the Almighty God. Rather than going to a place where they're worshipping another thing, where the Lord is driving them away from His presence, rather than go to that place, I will stay in my room alone, I worship the Almighty God. You'll need to take your stand. Stand for righteousness. And stand for holiness. And realize that this is the consecration and the commitment of the believer, of the soldier, to the captain of our salvation. And it will mean that everything you do in word or in deed, you do everything to the glory of God in First Corinthians chapter 10 verse 31. Where, where that therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do you do all to the glory of God you do all to the glory of God point number three steadfastness in doctrine already we have learnt all the doctrines major cardinal doctrines of the scripture and now what remains but for us to pledge ourselves into the hands of the Lord and to say, Lord, I will never depart from the truth of the word of God. In First Timothy chapter 4 and in verse 16, take heed unto yourself and unto the doctrine, continue in them. Continue in them. For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. The basis by which eventually you'll be allowed to go safely into the kingdom of God 
is that you continue in the teaching of the scripture. You know, day by day, people are leaving this world and are going to the great beyond. Listen, many people we think are in heaven now. If it's a surprise when we get there, we'll not be there. The standard of the world is so high. A little anger can stop your way from getting there. That continued malice can stop your way from getting there. That worldliness, little thing, that ties you together with Jezebel, can stop you from getting there. That compromise in doctrine can stop you from getting there. Because you see, when you compromise like that, you are rebellious against the scripture. Because it says, if there come any unto you, and he does not bring this doctrine, says, receive him not into your house. And if you receive him to your house, you have sinned, because you have disobeyed scripture. Neither bid him God's speed, because if you do, by giving him your tithe, by giving him offering, you have disobeyed the scripture. You have become a partaker of their evil deed. Are there not many people here that support false doctrine? By the grace of God, because I know the importance of heaven, I'm very, very careful where I go, what I do, who I associate with. And because of my opportunities, I get called into a number of places. And in those places where they call me, Sometimes it's not deep alive, but then because of the privilege and the opportunity of going to preach the word of God, sometimes, not always, sometimes I accept. And last month, I was in Ghana. I was there in May for deep alive, workers retreat. But June, I was there not for deeper life, but for a meeting of bishops and archbishops and key leaders uh, from all over. And um, they told me to speak on a particular subject. And I, they wanted my outline before that time. They had sent in an outline to me that uh, this outline will be good if I can follow that outline. But I prepared a new outline and sent to them and said, this is the outline I will use. When they saw that outline, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, consistent Christian living, and quite a lot of things, immediately I came they, didn't, they couldn't cancel the appointment anymore. Uh, so they just uh, told me, they said, uh, our time is gone. And that uh, we don't, uh, and anybody who knows me knows that uh, my introduction will take at least 20 minutes before I get to the real matter, the real subject. And so they uh, told me that uh, there's no time at all. Therefore, all I add for prayer, for introduction, for the body, for the conclusion, for everything, 20 minutes. And I said, that's all right. Because already I had left Nigeria, I was there already. And I looked at my time very well uh, to gauge the 20 minutes. And in the middle of it, I looked at the people, I said, bishops, and not bishops. I need to tell you, except a man be born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. And I said, the planners of the program may not like to hear this, but it's the word of the Almighty God that except a man be born again. 
And Louis Bush was there because it was an AD 2000 meeting. It came from all the way from America. Others were there. And I, they were sitting right there. And, you know, be big men in Christendom. I said, ye must be born again. And I said, I want to tell you there are bishops here who are not born again. And if you die, sell fire. That if we don't stand by that, that all that you preach in any denomination will be nothing in the sight of God. And at the end of the meeting, I said, rise up. If you are not born again, we are going to pray together. Uh, that, it wasn't workers' retreat of deeper life. Those were big, big people. And after we finished, somebody ran to the uh, organizer. Because just a Sunday before I, I got there, there had been a hot argument among them in the executive. Why did you, why did you invite this man? Why did you invite this man? <laughs> but uh, after the, I was surprised that after, after I finished, the report I had later is that one of the bishops ran to the uh, person organize, that organized it, that they were challenging, why did you invite him? The man said, this is the man we need. Now what he has said, nobody else is bold to say it, but somebody has to say it. And uh, at the, then they reproduced the cassettes. And I was surprised with how direct I was. They were rushing for those cassettes. And they abandoned all many other cases that other people gave that were sweet and nice. And this one, that was right on the point. They were rushing for it. Why are you fearful? Why don't you preach the truth? Why don't you stand on this doctrine? I was invited to the Assemblies of God some time ago in Britain. And these people, ministers, in their, in their midst... Many of them, about 2,000, old, old men. Some of them, 60, 65, quite old. And uh, when I got there, began from repentance, restitution, salvation, sanctification, Holy Ghost baptism, no divorce and remarriage. I had two sessions to preach. I went through everything. After I finished, a woman came to me. And the woman said, 25 years ago, the way you preach this morning is the way our pastors were teaching us. And when she told me, my husband, let me, they told me to stay like that. I stayed for 10 years without that man. And eventually by prayer, the man came back after I waited for 10 years. But then he, she said, but the preachers who preached to me at that time, they are, they are here this morning. He, she said at that time, now they have changed that doctrine. And those I waited for 10 years and I didn't go to marry another person. Now they are marrying people who have left their wives and are wanting to marry other people. But 25 years ago, she said, they taught us to stand like you told us this morning. And then he said, please keep coming. I was in another Assemblies of God church because they invited me. And I stayed with the pastor in his house. And as we got up in the morning that day, he called me and he said, look at this outline. I will want you to preach it tonight because it's a very good outline. I got it from him and didn't read even the first word. I kept it. And I didn't go to the breakfast table. I stayed inside. And I waited upon the Lord. In the night, we went to the meeting. And he came to me and said, Have you looked through that outline? How is it? I said, Don't talk now. And that night, I listened to the Lord, and I brought out the message of the Word of God. 
there were some people that left the church because they were against that pastor. There were three families. And I didn't discuss with him. In fact, I kept myself away. And I wouldn't even eat at the same time. And uh, when I go out like that, many, many things they provide and put on the table, I don't even touch. And so, he didn't tell me that they were there. And as when I wanted to start the message, I said, here we are tonight. And I introduced myself, and I said, I'm from Nigeria. But I said, tonight, I'm going to be hard. That was my first time there. And then I started, and the Lord took over, and I pointed like this, and I didn't know. I said, you left the church because you are against this man. And this, this, and this. I pointed again to another direction. I pointed to another direction. I said, repent and come back. The pastor was trembling because those were the people. And if he felt that they would say the pastor has reported them to this man from Nigeria. But the Lord took over. They repented. And they gave themselves. At the end of the meeting, the pastor himself came out, a white man. And he knelt down. He said, church, I thought I was pastoring. But tonight, I heard the word of God. And then he told the congregation, he said, congregation, join me as the pastor from Nigeria lays hands on me to pray for me so I can work for God. Preach the gospel. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And you know, it was a long night because after they saw their pastor like that, kneel down so that he can be prayed for to really serve the Lord. They all came one by one wanting to be prayed for. It will take me time to tell you the things that happened. The things we didn't plan for, the things that happened. It, that will t that's another story. After we finished, he called me. He said, please, anytime you come to this city, London, don't give me any notice. Just come into the church. The moment I see you, I will vacate the pulpit you will preach. If you will stand for the truth of the word of God, the spirit of God will back you up. One, two, three. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stood firm. Will you stand firm? Rise up and let us pray. We can stand firm on the word of God. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Stand on the unchanging word of God. Don't change the doctrine. Don't change the word of God. Stand on the unchanging word of the Almighty God. 